Okay, we're ready. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we're gonna do uh, the first presentation today. Uh, we're gonna talk about what work is doing on OpenStack and a little bit of our journey of um, how we're going to, uh, to deploy OpenStack in production, some of the challenges that we went through. Um, I would like to talk a little bit of what they prefer. Let me introduce myself and my colleague. My name is Edgar Magana. I'm a cloud operations architect at Worthy. I'm also a core developer for Neutron. I've been doing OpenStack since uh, 2011, Santa Clara Summit, so I, I have a, some record on this. Um, I want to let my friend, Imtiaz, introduce himself. Hi, I'm Imtiaz Choudhury. I'm a senior software engineer at Workday. Uh, right now, I'm involved with Edgar in deploying our private cloud. So, uh, Worthy is a SaaS company, software as a service company. We build everything in our, in our cloud. We provide handling resources and finance applications for all our customers. We have uh, a number of customers like running every day, um, their payroll, their uh, recruiting, all number, a number of activities and applications that we provide for them in our cloud. And we are taking this journey into providing OpenStack to have uh, more um, elastic uh, system for deploying all these applications in our premises. So we actually have a lot of um, operations challenge. So we're gonna talk about them. We're gonna show you uh, our architecture. We're gonna talk about specifically the CI pipeline, the environments that we actually have to create for um, our development team and deployment team. And we're going to talk a little, a little bit about the, the key takes away, and we have, we're going to have uh, time for questions. We are going to also show you um, the live of DCI system all back in our data centers in um, uh, Portland, if the connectivity is good. So let's talk about the operational challenge. This is any, any OpenStack deployment requires um, some, some customization. Uh, in the case of Wordy, uh it's a little bit even, even harder because we wanted to deploy multiple clouds uh, because we have multiple data centers because we want to actually provide it to different teams, different um, areas inside of Wordy. So it was very important for us to have an automation system to do that deployment, and I think everybody will have that. Identpotent, um, because all these number of clouds, we want to have the identical uh, configuration across all these clouds. The hardware configuration went the same, the network configuration went the same, so we wanted that the software that it was running on those data centers were exactly the same in terms of configuration. Uh, security, that's, um, that was kind of like the nightmare uh, working in, 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 in the OpenStack deployment. So you may have already security on your endpoints. That's actually, we have certificates for all the uh, communication on all the projects, right? <coughs> talking to Keystone, talking to NOAA, Neutron, et cetera. So that was the first step that we have, but our security teams and compliance teams, they also wanted to have a SSL enabled on the combination to the RabbitMQ message queue and also on the MySQL communication. On the top of that, they want us to have um, IP tables configuration for all the bare metal deployments. For the um, virtual machines, so the overlay network that we're gonna talk a little bit about more later, we have started using uh, Neutron, then we switched to NSDN. Um, obviously, they wanted to have a stable going to production for a company like what it was very, very important, the stability. We have uh, uh, year after year, over 90, 95% of customer satisfaction. We don't want to go lower on that. We actually wanted to keep the numbers or we wanted to even increase them. Uh, production readiness, uh, our operations team, the team who's gonna be the first line of defense if something was broken or something was not working, they want us to have like good login information. So we actually enable syslog and we send it to um, um, syslog server to collect all the logs and use some <coughs> elastic search to identify some potential bugs. Uh, monitoring, they want to have like part of their NOx system. So they wanted to have like good dashboard, a good set of alarms to detect when something was not going well. Um, any, any person that actually runs on the, on the real world in the data center, they know that we cannot enable three or four networks um, on, the, 
on the OpenStack. You see any kind of documentation, they will ask you to have like a management network, an API network, a data network, out of a network. That is not possible in the, in the real data center because that will require a bunch of top of the rack switches that you won't be able to maintain and it's gonna increase the cost of your data center. So we have bond interfaces. We have all the communication through one interface and the second one is just for the out of the band and all that it has HA. Um, obviously has to, have, has to have a multi-tenant, even that is a private cloud. <coughs> and we have a very, very good enforcement of policy groups. I was telling you before, our security team asked us to have very specific configuration or communication uh, set up between the VMs and we were able to, to get that through, through SDN. So with that, just to give you a little bit of the um, overview, the high level architecture where we're deploying, as I say, uh, we have uh, two top of the racks um, switches in each one of the, uh, each one of the racks, uh, a, each one of the um, servers, they have a bond interface that actually have two communications going to, the, to each one of these uh, switches that actually will enable HA. Uh, we started using uh, Neutron and then we switched to Open Control because of the security requirements that we wanted on the overlay network. And then we also decided to split uh, some of the, component, the components of Open Control in two different servers. We wanted to have all the analytics information, which is very, very um, uh, extensive in one individual server and uh, all the configuration and the, and the control in a, in a different box. The reason behind it is because all the analytics is information that we don't want to impact your control plane at all. And having it, everything in the same server could actually impact it. So that actually improved the performance and the reliability. Then we have a, bond, uh, a set of uh, compute nodes in the production system that we have. Uh, we don't have storage nodes yet as they are. We have our team working very hardly in actually getting the Ceph implemented. So um, I'm expecting to like have like uh, four or five weeks where we are going to start adding a bunch of storage servers into this cloud. So with that, uh, I want to pass over MTS to start explaining what, uh, what was the journey of the CI CD system and why we have to use it. Thanks, Edgar. So how it all started, uh, our goal was to deploy OpenStack with community cookbooks and community resources. We wanted to deploy OpenStack and we wanted to make sure we can leverage from community what's already available from the community. Uh, at Workday we use Chef as our configuration management tool. There are other options, but Workday already is invested, so we wanted to use that. The first deployment, we started with the community cookbooks. It's an OpenStack Chef project in GitHub. Uh, we started with that, and we soon realized the project had a very simple implementation. We could bring up an OpenStack cluster with one controller and compute node with two vagrant boxes, and we were evaluating at this point. So we could do this in our, on our laptop using virtual uh, vagrant, and uh, we soon realized that this model has its limitation. For example, it didn't have a separate chef server. It could provision using vagrant chef, but there are a lot of features, for example, search that doesn't work in the Vagrant option. So we needed to have a chef server that replicates what the same chef server that we have in our production. So we need to realize that we need a separate chef server. And we soon realized once we use a chef server and let's say we have this simple deployment with a single OpenStack controller and compute, we don't know after it's set up, whether the provisioning is right, whether it, all the functionalities of Keystone, Neutron, uh, Glance, they're per working or not. And how do we do that? The best way is to use Tempest. So we realized Tempest would be nice to have. Then we realized it'll be, we wanted to build a continuous integration pipeline. And one way to achieve that is to add Jenkins. So we needed a, another server. And then, as Edgar already mentioned, we instead of using uh, just Neutron with ML2 plugin, we wanted to use an SDN solution, and that required yet another server. And finally, like to benchmark performance, we need a Drally. 
So there are all these servers that we needed, and we are, at, at this point, still evaluating on our laptop. And building all these things on separate virtual machines, it's very computationally intensive, and it doesn't quite work. And also to complicate things further, we also wanted to be able to share some of the components that we don't need to build over and over again. For example, Chef Server, Rally, Tempest, Jenkins. We don't need to bring up a fresh virtual box and ins configure and install it. It takes a lot of time. So, so we wanted a solution that will let us like, reuse these components. That led us to containers. Like, What are the drivers for using containers? First of all, it's lightweight. Instead of creating six, seven virtual machines on our laptop, we could bring up all these things in a single container on a single VM. Second thing, it's reusable. The components that I showed, Chef Server, Jenkins, Rally, Tempest, people don't have to spend lots of time bring, building those and bringing it up. We can just create them once, put it in a Docker image repository, and reuse it. And it can be shared with the entire community. And as I said, this is shareable. Uh, and that led us to our chef development framework. This is our first uh, take at it. And we are, again, still evaluating all the community technology sources at this point. And for our virtual machine, we used a Fedora 20 Vagrant uh, box. In production, we use CentOS. And that was one of the reasons for using Fedora. We need a newer version of kernel for our getting many of the Docker features to work. And on that virtual machine, we bring up first Docker engine. And on top of Docker, we bring up all these containers. So this was our development environment where we proved that the continuous integration model can work, so that we can bring up a chef server, Jenkins, and bring up an entire OpenStack cloud on your on our laptop, and all the developers who were involved in this project initially, we could share the same dev environment, and we were getting the same results. Everyone got the exact same number of Tempest failures. So it was a very reproducible environment, and it was very useful for us to get to the next phase of our development. And on, to make things even better, we added a few other uh, containers, DNS, we added, we realized that in Docker, as you delete a container and recreate it, it, you get a new IP address. And sometimes with Chef, it gets a little difficult bar changing your IP address over and over again. So instead of doing that, we used a DNS service and addressed all the containers by their host name instead of IP address. We also did some LDAP to Keystone integration. And again, doing that thing, it's a little challenging, but having an LDAP container that mimics our production LDAP was very easy, and we were able to do that in the development as well. So if you just let me add something in the previous slide. So I really want you to realize the potential of this environment. So you have a system running in a four gigabytes VM in your laptop that is actually exactly what you're going to run in production and minimal scale. At the beginning, a lot of the people in the company were accepted about this because they didn't realize the potential of this framework. When we were start running Tempest tests across all the developers in our organization, one thing was very common, as Imtia said. The number of Tempest tests that we start failing were exactly the same in every single laptop doing the system. And you will say, like, why you're so proud to have in Tempest tests failing in your system? It's not about if they were failing or not. We didn't focus on that part. We were focused on having an automated system, repeatable, that it was exactly a mirror from each one of us running in different environments, different laptops, etc. This is an amazing environment because, A, you are mimicking what you're going to be running on your uh, data center in production, and B, Think about it for Wordate, the, the journey that started with a bunch of developers that they didn't even know what was OpenStack. They didn't even know what was open control. They didn't know a lot of things that involved a lot of the learning. And that was the perfect sandbox for them to do it, to play with it, to experiment, to kill it, to destroy it, rebuild it again. 
and do it in a very safe, quickly manner everywhere. They don't need to have connected to the network. They don't need to do that. When the system is up and running, it's self-contained, it's self-isolated, and they can do whatever they want. That was a perfect mechanism to drive our team to actually learn on OpenStack as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So our first iteration, now that we, for the developers, they would first start a Vagrant VM, as I said, bring up Docker, then we bring up a Jenkins container, and Jenkins was configured to bring up Chef server, and we bring up OpenStack controller. Well, initially it's just a blank container, and Chef provisions is a as a container, sorry, OpenStack controller. Next we bring up a compute, and entire OpenStack, and finally we get bring up Tempest, run, Tempest and get the results and all the results you can uh, see on from Jenkins and the good thing is also that uh, you have entire log if in case chef fails you just go to Jenkins you have all the logs from the previous runs in the next iteration we started with uh, Neutron with ML2 plugin which worked fine and we wanted to use open control plugin and to do that, there were some changes that we had to do, and we created new virtual machines. And one reason why they could not be containers was we were actually testing IP tables for, open, for, the, for our SDN controller. And it's not really feasible to do it in containers. Docker has its own IP tables. We didn't want to make it too complicated. And that was one of the reasons why we had to split it. And this is the development environment. So now that we talked about development environment, the laptop environment, and we proved that the community cookbooks are good enough, we can tweak it to use it in production, we went to the next phase. We built our continuous integration and development using OpenStack and OpenContrail on virtual machines. And this is, so our continuous integration on virtual machines, we took some concepts from Triple O, our Open OpenStack on OpenStack. So we have our OpenStack running on bare metal, and then we create a bunch of virtual machines that pretty much mimics the, our development setup that I already showed. And the goal was we wanted to have a very disposable test environment. Developers will check in something. You can bring up an entire cloud, do the testing, throw it out, and pe people are doing it in parallel. So we wanted many, many of these small cloud instances. And we run OpenStack ice house, so our under cloud, our bare metal environment was uh, OpenStack, which was also you set up the same manner with Chef and fully automated fashion. And then for we used Ruby Fog library to interact from Jenkins to the OpenStack controller. I mean, there are other options. It's just work that's pretty heavy on Ruby, so we continued using that. And the way it works, our development pipeline is the developers, they work on Git, they'll check in their code when patches, which triggers a, and create a Garrett review. Garrett triggers a Jenkins build. Jenkins then talks to our OpenStack controller and brings up an, this, uh, a number of virtual machines, one of which will be a chef server, another become like, a, and we bring up a few other machines, which then Chef provisions them as OpenStack controller, uh, SDN controller, compute, and Tempest, and then again, running Tempest results and the Tempest test and get the results. So that's the same idea, but this time everything's done on virtual machines. This is uh, the workflow. And as I was saying, from Jenkins, when a developer submits a new patch, Jenkins tells OpenStack controller to launch a chef server. In this case, we actually created a chef server image, which makes like, so that we don't have to provision chef server to begin with. And once the chef server comes up, it goes to our Git repository, it fetches the patch set that the developer submitted, and it uploads it on the chef server. And then it creates other virtual machines, uh, 
OpenStack controller, SDN controller, compute, Tempest. All these things can be done in parallel. There's a little bit of orchestration required. The OpenStack controller needs to come up first before the SDN controller and compute comes up. Even between SDN controller and compute, there, there is a slight orchestration required, like one has to come up before the other. So we, that, those are taken care of on the Jenkins side, the script that we use to bring up the entire cloud. It takes care of that part of the orchestration. And we run Chef Client, and then all of these things are provisioned. And then finally, we run uh, Tempest and get the results. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you again to look at this picture and remember the previous one. So in the past, we have a very great environment for developers to test everything they wanted to test in their laptops. Then because of the requirements on the IP tables and the SDN testing, um, the laptop environment wasn't good enough and actually well it's slowing us as in uh, productivity. So we hope we created this uh, first cloud with that first version that we have it on OpenStack. And then we create n number of tenants. Each one of these tenants will be one of our developers and then we have n number of VMs that actually they will deploy it through the Jenkins servers that we have to <clears throat> actually deployed all these uh, components, another chip server, an OpenStack controller, SDN controller, compute, Tempest, Rally, ran all, all the tests, and actually dispose all that environment over and over. So we were moving from that simple environment to a little bit more robust. And then on the top of that, we were testing our production system even, to, even before going to production, as it was a public cloud. So that was actually getting a lot of good <coughs> feedback inside of the company. <clears throat> and also it was giving us a lot of the good um, information that we wanted for the benchmark in running the reality test. So if in your company you are struggling to actually how to convince the management team going to open a stack, this is a great environment. Thanks, Edgar. And one other thing that this model let us do is also to test how the bare metal or cloud performs because once we started using this thing, developers were checking in and we made this a parallel uh, Jenkins build. So as people were creating new patches, we, we had times where there would be creating like 20 of these jobs at the same time. So we see all these VM virtual machine clouds are getting spawned at the same time. So we were actually exercising our under cloud a little bit and see how OpenStack performs. And so far, I mean, we've seen some issues. Uh, and the philosophy we follow is eat your own dog food. And this let us uh, resolve some of those minor issues at the beginning. And so that brings us to our road to production. So first, as, as I mentioned, we started with our development setup, which was a simple Vagrant and Docker container. We were with Docker containers. We were building and testing. So well, people, developers are still using it, but they're gradually moving into more into the virtual machine thing as because as Edgar was saying, as we are added more and more components, it was getting a little difficult to work in that environment. Then we moved everything to virtual machines. And finally, we also have a bare metal continuous integration system. So what happens is once a code is submitted and it passes virtual, our virtual continuous integration test, we merge that code and then it gets promoted after doing a full in, uh, systems test. So we run everything with all the cookbooks, not only just the community cookbooks, we also have work the cookbooks on top. And once we test everything, the community cookbooks and the work the cookbooks together, and we don't find any issues, we promote those set of cookbooks, we call those our bill of material. They get promoted and we know like th these are ready to go into production. And then they go into like one chef server and that chef server is used for our weekly promotion and like for maintenance. We use that chef server to deploy our, our bare metal open stack. And on bare metal, we are also running continuous integration. It's not triggered by Garrett as opposed to the virtual machine uh, continuous integration. It's a scheduled. And the difference between virtual machine and bare metal uh, integration is we don't dispose our bare metal installation. Like we have a working cloud which is up in operation and production. 
And as we create new patches, we just like run chef client again to add the new patches without throwing it down. We cannot do it like that'll require throwing out everything. So that's not possible. So in our bare metal, it's an upgrade mode. We as opposed to virtual machines where we do from fresh install every time. So that's one of the differences. But bare metals continuous integration also runs all the time. Um, so some of the key takeaways. So it took us a lot of iteration to get where we are. Uh, it wasn't done in, uh, in one day. As I said, like we started with the development environment. And even there, we first started with just Neutron with OVS. Then we added more and more components. And then we moved on to the virtual machines and eventually to bare metal. The Docker and Vagrant, it proved to be a very powerful chef development environment. Uh, and it uh, helped us doing rapid prototyping. Without it, I don't think we could convince management to adopt OpenStack with this per open community cookbooks. The containers were also a lifesaver. Initially, when we were prototyping, we didn't have any like machines to even try it on. So we needed something, and the Docker and virtual machine uh, virtu was the way to go. And sharing with images was another thing. Container images was a, made things much easier for us. And <laughs> by building a continuous integration framework, we improved our developers' agility quite a bit. Developers could submit their patches, and not everyone now needs to test their code. They create a patch. It passes Jenkins. They know it's good enough. Then it goes through review. If everyone likes their code and uh, it gets approved, then it's merged. And then we have another build that makes sure the system build passes and everything. And uh, this gave us very predictable outcome. So everything that we see in our virtual CI was very predictable of what the outcome will be in our bare metal. If it didn't pass, we would see the same results on bare metal. So we knew exactly what to predict. And so far, we haven't really run into any issues where things work in virtual machine, doesn't work in bare metal. There are maybe few minor things that we found, but most of the cases, virtual machines were a very good indicator of what, to, what we would see in bare metal. So we, we're doing very good in time, which is great. So um, I was unsure about the time. So we're going to be able to show a little bit of the demo, what we're talking about here. Um, so um, we're going to show exactly what is our over cloud. You are. So as you can see here in this uh, dashboard, I'm actually accessing my um, overcloud, uh, overcloud server, my OpenStack controller. And as you can see, I'm actually signing with my own username and password, right? This is connected to LDAP. So actually, I'm just using my corporate credentials to get into this system. And obviously, this deployment will take over, I don't know, one hour, 45 minutes, almost two hours, because you have to deploy all the VMs. Then you have to create a chip server. Then you have to upload all the cookbooks. And once all the cookbooks are actually uploaded, you actually pull all the, all the packages to create another VM, which is probably the OpenStack controller VM. Actually get all the packages into that VM, start running chef clients, will install all the packages. And you do that uh, for the SDN controller, for the um, UI part and the analytics part of the SDN controller, et cetera. So that, that will take a lot of time. So we actually just simplify here a little bit um, what we want to show you. So as you can see, this is the overcloud, the 2128. We have a bunch of VMs that we already automatically created through a um, simple CLI command. Uh, so we have our chip server, we have our SDN controller, the OpenStack controller. Uh, the open control controller, the analytics part of the controller. Obviously, you want to have a less one compute node for testing. Uh, we can actually add more VMs and add more compute one, uh, nodes if we want it. We have our uh, uh, Tempest node 
and we have also the elk node, which is actually where we're sending all the all the syslog. So if I show here, so this is uh, this is our Cabana dashboard. We're actually collecting all the all the logs here. Um, I'm intentionally not putting all the logs in a readable fashion for, for security concerns, but actually you can get um, um, set of alarms and set of system here configured to actually know what's going on in your cloud. You don't need to SSH to any of the compute nodes, everything goes here. This is what it needs um, in a production system. You don't SSH to the computer to know what's going on or the SDN controller or something. You actually could provoke more damage than actually what you want to fix, so we actually get everything here. We actually have... Um, um, and also monitoring system, and um, coming back, which is um, an Agile server, coming back to this um, over cloud. So what I'm going to do now is um, checking out the IP address 10.96.68.3 um, for my um, OpenStack controller. So I already have another tab here. So you check out this. This is the 10.96.68.3. So this is my dashboard. This is my OpenStack controller on my over cloud. So I'm running on OpenStack on OpenStack. So think about how powerful is this. Um, you can actually test any hot patch in your system. Be sure that you run all the Tempest tests, that everything is working properly. We're not talking about here dev stack, and I'm happy with that. But uh, this is for reality. This is for production systems. And in this one, you can actually create any, any crazy uh, patch that you want to explore as a developer, as a system integrator, and see what is going to happen. Actually, for this one, I'm going to uh, join as an admin to show you a little bit more. And obviously the network is down, as always. Hold on. What happened with my network? Yeah, the Wi-Fi is down. Okay, it went back. Okay. So in the meantime that I'm actually logging in, if you have some questions, so you can actually start uh, going to the micro. Okay, um, what I'm doing right now, I'm actually creating a tunnel all the way to my data center where my overclock is connected, is created. There you are, I'm connected, so I'm going back here. So I'm actually you can you can you can see based on this uh, network connectivity issue that we are actually going all the way to the data center at Word. <clears throat> so here we have um, this is our, my overcloud. I just have one compute node, so it's going to show up here. And um, I've been playing with this um, server the whole morning, so I'm actually I'm actually destroying things, creating things. Um, so as you can see we have a CISDN compute node and exactly is the same that I was actually assigned on my um, over cloud here. This is the compute node, which is actually what I'm seeing here in this over cloud. And actually I could have a 
controller server, actually, um, if you want to get familiar with the uh, control policies, this is a good way to actually test it. So you can do whatever you want in this over cloud. You can actually, um, has a lot of potential right now. So MTS and I, we didn't mention this part. We're using the, um, the, the Fedora um, uh, or RDO packages for, for OpenStack deployment. So we don't want to mess right now with the Python code. So if we identify an issue, we try to backport it uh, directly on, on uh, with some, um, some of the Fedora or the real packages. But um, the day of tomorrow, there has a lot of potential because we want all our developers to do Python changes. In order to do that, we can build our own packages and we can actually retest and this over cloud and we can validate if we are actually breaking something, not just from the Tempest side, also from the Rally side. So we can actually compare the benchmark values from a functional cloud to the next patch, to the next patch, and so on. We are scheduling patches every two weeks right now. and um, to be honest, the first time that we scaled the first patch through the chip server, we were a little bit scary. Everything went fine. We did not find any issues. We did not lose connectivity at all in any of the VMs. So that's actually, we scaled like two hours windows, uh, maintenance windows. We did it like in 10 minutes or less. So that was actually, actually very cool. With that, so we're done. So we're going to um, ask if you have some, um, some feedbacks or some questions. So we have a couple of minutes for that. Thank you. How do you uh, manage the life cycle of your artifacts within these pipelines? And so, for example, you said you use the RDO packages, and if your tests take one hour during the, the pipeline, uh, how do you ensure that uh, a new release or on a chef uh, cookbook is not coming in production that was not really tested in uh, development? How, do you, how can you freeze the versions? He's the master of that. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> so all the, we are not, uh, in production, we are not taking anything from the internet. In our data center has no internet connectivity for security. So, and you know, everything, all the uh, cookbooks that we picked up from upstream, they're copied over locally, and they only get promoted and go to the, our production chef server, as I said, after they go through this phased so first, they have to pass our continuous integration test when they go through that and system test. W once that's passed, we have a list, of the, their versions are bumped. So let's say we start with cookbook 1.0, everything passes, we bump it to 1.01. And then that we label that version of cookbook as uh, promoted. So, and then we have a list of artifacts. Jenkins keeps all the list of artifacts like these are the set of cookbooks that are already tested in, with our s systems tests. And we know, and we can go to Jenkins and say, okay, this is the list of tests and we have our upgrade, a weekly maintenance script, which where you can say, I want to use this policy group, which is a JSON file with all the cookbook versions listed. And it just takes that one, uploads on the chef server, and we use that to do our maintenance. And, and the same for all the libraries that we have. We, we have our internal mirrors for all the RPM packages. Yeah. If we want to explore a new version of the library, we put first in a quarantine or a testing a repo. We create this over cloud pointing to that repo. We verify that everything works. And then we promote that specific library into our production the repos. Thanks, guys. That was just fantastic. You know, I think that's really valuable. I just wanted to ask, how consumable is this outside of the workday environment? Is this something you can give back? Because I see it as something very valuable for us as contributors to be able to get, you know, this complete workflow from your, your laptop, you know, on the train on the way to work to be able to get uh, patches in and upstreamed. So I just wanted to see if, if this is consumable outside the workday environment. So it is not yet. So we recently, um, as a consequence of the ops, mid ops that we've been having, so Word has been very active in those, um, on those operations, um, mid ops. So we've basically created new repos on the Git account or OpenStack that is called ops tooling, ops monitoring, and there's another one that I don't remember the name. So we are talking to the, um, the PTL of the apps between Tom and, and JJ Asgard to actually push all this code. Once we clean a little bit of the um, URLs, you can imagine to the all, all the 
uh, URLs for the jump configuration is pointed to our internal data center. So we want to put it back into the environment files or the policy groups that we're using for this deployment. And then it's going to be consumable for everybody. But um, that's going to be the repo where we're going to push this code. So we're going to while with, with OpenStack uh, contribution upstream from Wordate. So we really want to get back to the community while we're deploying here. Thank you, guys. Um, there, there was a lady waiting in the micro, so you want to take the micro. Um, I have a question about if the code is related to the hardware. Um, for example, it's the driver of some data store. So can this code can be tested in the virtual machine on the Docker, or you have to left the um, test case to the bare metal side? It can it can it can run in modes. It's um, in the in the virtual machine when you're running all the tempests and when you're running all the rally things. Obviously, rally doesn't really make sense to run it on VMs. Uh, so we actually create a new cluster that we call the perf cluster. We have over compute nodes in that ones exactly the same configuration that we're running in this over cloud for the benchmarking part. So actually, to have realistic data. Um, it will work. You will get uh, results, but it will actually, it will actually, you have a very low, low numbers and performance. Um, I don't know. You want to add something on that part? No. I, did that answer your question, or was, did we miss something? Um, uh, uh, I I don't know if uh, if the uh, the machine in the Docker can connect outside to. Um, to the storage uh, device that is the uh, different kind of storage device that uh, that outside of the uh, uh, you, you are the uh, of the open stick maybe uh, uh, storage device like uh, yeah. are you talking about Ceph or something? Uh, yes, this is yeah. a mm -hmm. physical storage device. <laughs> you, you you can mount storage as Docker permits, and then you can add storage or some volumes to your host first mm -hmm. and then mount it on Docker. We actually expanded uh, our model, uh, which I didn't show. We tested Ceph on Docker as well, and that also works. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. We had to do like things at the kernel level, some hacks in there to get it to work, but it works. And you can actually mount volumes, but again, like I mean, on your laptop, you're limited to do certain things. Uh, but it is possible. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we just have Time for one last question, so could you just uh, take the micro? Okay. For Ceph, no, we proved that we can bring up Ceph with the, it gets provisioned the same way with a chef server. So in Docker container, we don't want to bring up an entire. Sorry, sorry. So it's, it's a, it's a storage? Yeah. So you're provisioning that uh, The second one, actually, we create three new containers and we actually deploy the chef client with the role of uh, a chef server. Uh, there is a little bit of extra orchestration needed for Ceph. Uh, you need to have the first uh, Ceph server uh, to be running before running the other ones. Um, we actually realized that, a, yes, an orchestration level is needed for all these components to run at the same time. On the other hand, having Chef, Ryan, the Chef Client automatically running on the back end of the system will fix it sooner or later. So let me give you an example. So if you run at the same time Chef Client for an OpenStack server and the compute node, the compute node will finish uh, faster than the OpenStack controller because it requires much more or less uh, configuration and packages to be deployed. So what is going to happen? That compute node will look for the chip server. I'm sorry, for the OpenStack controller server, and that server will not be ready on time. So the compute will fail. Will not be able to actually subscribe to the RabbitMQ on the controller. However, 
uh, once the OpenStack controller is completed, the chef client in the compute node will keep running. We actually have a configuration to be running every 15 minutes, so the next 15 minutes it will run again and it will try to subscribe back again, and then it will, uh, it's going to find um, the controller. So if you deploy everything at the same time, things will not work, but chef client will actually let you to fix things automatically in the back end. Um, to be honest, we really don't want to do it that way. It seems a little bit messy. We want to have some kind of uh, or construction level on the top of that. So we're investigating things like M Collective for this chef environment. So um, I think we're, we're on time. So I really, I really want to thank you everybody for coming here. This is the first session of the, of the day after a very good party yesterday night. So um, that was awesome to see you all here. Thank you so much again. Thank you everybody. And in case you have questions, you can like come to us and we, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have.